So thank you everyone for attending. I know it is, is late for those who are uh, just here for the, uh, the, the Apache Con. Uh, it's good to see uh, a number of people here. Uh, since it is a relatively uh, small room, a relatively small number of people, I like to keep this very dynamic. So uh, if there are questions as we go through the presentation, please you know, stop and raise your hand and stuff like that, like for this to be a, a dialogue more than a monologue. Um, the topic that we'll talk about, and uh, as the title suggests, is three shall be the number. Uh, that is from Monty Python, the Holy Grail. Um, and basically it's talking about all the different aspects between licensing, community, governance, and things like that, the whole complexity of that. Uh, a little bit about myself. Uh, at the ASF, I wear a number of, of different hats. Um, for completeness, I guess I could be like, uh, I, I helped co-found the ASF. Um, I did uh, one of the board of directors, been president and chairman, and, and all kinds of different stuff. Um, although this is uh, not really an, an Apache take on licensing and governance and stuff like that, a lot of that is based on my experience uh, at the ASF. I'm also uh, associated with a, another open source uh, entity called Outer Curve. It's a 501c6 uh, and Marsec XL. I used to be with the, uh, the OSI for, for a while as well. Uh, and to pay the bills, I'm very fortunate to work for a company called Red Hat, which you may have heard of, that helps me uh, keep on doing the kind of fun stuff that I, that I do nowadays. So the whole topic, the whole reason for this, uh, this, uh, this session is really, uh, really easy. Um, there are a lot of complexity details regarding open source, licensing, community, governance, how to build community and things like that. Everything has their own different variation. You know, you look at the number of different licenses out there and stuff like that. So how can you make uh, sense of all those conflicting details uh, out there? And so what I'm going to try to do is take all these different varying aspects of open source and free software and distill them down into easily digestible chunks that you can then take away with at least a core understanding of what some of these concepts and tenets within open source mean. It doesn't look like, there we go. Anybody remember this? Yes, it is. From Schoolhouse Rock. So the reason why I have this is because really when you think about it, you really can distill all these various topics to basic three core tenets, you know, three, door, three core types of different things that we'll be talking about. For example, one of the main questions that's asked a lot is why do people involve themselves in open source? What is it about open source that drives people? Uh, and so first of all, looking at the end user, what is it that drives people, uh, end users, to, to looking at open source? And th this and the next two slides are the most wordy slides I have. So we won't talk about those, but you'll see most of these are the mom and apple pie stuff that you've always talked about. Better software, avoiding vendor lock-in, uh, better quality, it supports open standards and things like that. So looking at it, those are the, 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 the main topics, the main reasons why users are, are driven towards open source much more than, than closed source. Uh, security is a major aspect as well, despite the, uh, the open SSL uh, you know, thing that just happened a couple days ago. What's important about that, the lesson to learn from that, is that it was found quickly, it was patched quickly. There was a, there was a, you know, from the period of time before it was known to the time it was patched, it was very, very quick. You weren't um, you know, vulnerable for a long period of time and that vulnerability wasn't hidden. What is it about companies and organizations that drive them into using or, or leveraging or even spending money in paying salaried uh, developers to do that? And these are some of the reasons behind there. First of all, they have a real impact on the, um, on the direction of the IT that they're involved with. Notice I don't say control. It's an impact. It's an influence. That's what you're really gaining when you're an open source uh, company that's involved with open source communities. And it's a real big uh, jump for a lot of companies. A lot of companies, quite frankly, can't do that. They want to be able to control the direction of open source. But you'll see that what's really important about open source is that you have the impact associated with it. And it allows for the nimbleness and the agility to be able to very, very quickly turn around by leveraging open source software out there, 
Companies are able to get to market quicker with better products and services and be much more agile as far as reflecting and changing their concepts depending on what the user, uh, uh, user committee uh, feedback is. And finally, uh, why do hackers and developers? You know, and for me, this is most probably the, the most powerful part of the open source and free software movement is the energy that it, it, it uh, gains from the energy of the developers out there. I've always considered um, uh, engineers and hackers and developers as artists. And their art is simply the code, the elegant hack. I mean, you think, you know, even the, the adjectives that we use, you know, that's elegant, that's beautiful, that's ugly, you know, it's an art form. And people create art because they want people to enjoy it, other people to enjoy it, people to critique it um, and help uh, grow their skills. And for hackers and developers, this is a great way of doing that. This is a great way of practicing your craft, sharing your craft with people out there, and improving your craft by gaining the feedback and the, um, the insights from other people as well. Now, the, um, the Free Software Foundation and, um, and, and OSI have their different uh, definitions of what uh, open source is or what free software is. For example, um, OSI has a very, very large list. I think it's like you know, 12 topics or something like that, which uh, uh, comprise the, the definition of the open source definition. If you follow these 12, 13, 14 things or whatever, that's what open source is about. Uh, the Free Software Foundation does a little bit differently. They're focused on freedoms, and they actually have four freedoms. They have zero, starting with zero, uh, and they go up to three. But four freedoms that they talk about that comprise what free software is about. Going again with the idea of um, three being a, the magic number, I think we can actually do much, much better than that. But first, before we do that, let's actually take this idea that code is actually cookies. And, and looking at it in both ways, code not only in the actual tangible part of the bits, the package that you give to people, but also in the source code, the recipe on how to make that stuff. And again, looking at cookies, it applies to both ways. Not only the concrete, uh, physical cookie itself, but the recipe behind that. And by using that analogy, we can find out, we can distill what open source and free software is, is about in three different types. First of all, is the, free, is the promise made between the open source community and the open source users to be able to use that craft, to use the software, to use the cookies. And in this way, we're seeing not only are you able to use it in the recipe form to create a cookie, but also you're able to use it by actually using the cookie itself. So you can use the, the, the software, but you can also use the end result in any way you want. We don't restrict how you, uh, you, know, how you bake the cookies, nor do we restrict how you eat the cookies. If you want to dunk it in milk, that's fine, okay? But that's the promise that for open, soft, uh, open source software provides, is that you can use what we provide to you in any way you want to. The third promise that uh, the, uh, the open source movement implies is the ability to actually modify the source code, the recipe, in any way you see fit. And on the left-hand side, what we're seeing is basically different variations based on a standard cookie model. You know, here's a standard cookie, but you know, you're seeing people adding raisins or chocolate chips or oats or something like that. That's modifying the recipe. It's modifying the source code. That's a promise that we made to you. You can actually do that. But not only can you do that at the source code level, but you can also do it with that finished artifact. And right here we see the person putting you know, icing on top of it. That's a modification of the end result of uh, what the creation process and what source is. And so by the ability to modify that source code, whether at the source code level, but also as the combined entity, that's another promise that the open source movement and free software provides to you. And finally, I think the, the final promise, but this is most probably, most probably the most important one, is the ability to share that, to share those modifications, either you know, the, the, the base recipe, the base cookie, to share that with whoever it is you want to share with in whatever way you want to share. If you just want to share the, the, you know, the, 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 the recipe, that's fine. If you want to share the, the cookie, it's fine. What's nice about code, um, other than cookies, is 
that poor girl has to split her cookie in half, and she only has half a cookie. But you can make as many copies of software as you want, and you don't lose anything out of the bargain. So it's even easier to share code than cookies in this, in this uh, abstraction out here. Another really um, complex topic um, that really hits a bunch of people um, is the idea of licensing. Okay, um, you know, OSI um, has you know, a whole bunch of approved licenses, so does the Free Software Foundation, um, and it's very, very difficult to like, distill down what, what licenses do, why should I choose this license, what are the variations between the licenses out there? And I think there are two different ways of looking at three different types of licenses that make a lot of sense. First of all, there's the licenses like the, the Apache V2 license or the BSD permissive licenses, which basically says, just give me credit. Okay, you can take the, the source code any way you want to, uh, do whatever it is you want to do with it, just make sure that people know that I wrote it. Give me some acknowledgement, you know, let them know that you know, if they want to get the original stuff, where it came from and things like that. But other than that, it's yours to do with whatever you want. So it really doesn't um, restrict a lot of um, you know, conditions, place a lot of conditions on what happens with that license or things like that. Now the second variation is, is the sort of like the, the weak copy left. You know, and these are like you know, the LGPL and the Eclipse public license. And it basically says, um, you know, if I give you the, the, the source code for something, okay, you can do whatever it is you want to do with it. But if you improve that, if you make modifications to what I gave you, be sure to share that with the rest of the community so we can all benefit from what you've done, okay? You just need to do that on the stuff that I gave you, okay? But everything else is yours to do as you wish. So just give me the fixes that you've made or the improvements that you've made on what I've shared with you so I can share them with everybody else. So everybody gains by, by the effort you put inside there. And finally, there is what's called the strong copy left, uh, the GPL, the AGPL, which is basically the, the give me everything you know, sort of uh, idea. And this is kind of unfair, and I admit that, uh, um, but to go with the, you know, the central motif, this most probably is the most accurate, which basically says once I give you a piece of software, you've got to make sure that everything pretty much that software touches is folded in the same way that I've shared it with you. So give me everything associated with, with the software that I've given, given to you. I, all the benefits and things like that, I want to make sure that I gain everything. So if you're using my software, I need to be able to ensure that everybody is able to use not only my software, but everything that you're using on top of my software. So give me everything. Does that make sense to some people? Um, I realize that can be somewhat uh, esoteric. So there's another way of looking at it as well. Permissive licenses are focused on the past. They're focused on making sure that people know where the ultimate origin is of a piece of code. They want to make sure that people know that if I need to have access to some code which is hidden away somewhere, that they know where that is. So their focus is, is making sure that that ultimate uh, shareable piece of code is always available and people know where that is. Now, we copy left are more worried about the present. Okay, they want to make sure that that source code is always up to date, is always modified, that is always being improved upon. And whoever makes those improvements, whoever provides those fixes, they want to make sure that the software is always up to date. So they're looking how, uh, how the software is being operated now, how it's being used now, and ensuring that that's all being up to date and current. And finally, the strong copyleft have a real concern about the future because they want to make sure that everything that the software touches will always remain free, will always remain. So whether it was free in the past or whether it's free now, I want to make sure that it's always free in the future. And that's the, that's the focus that they have. They want to maintain that consistency from the past, present, all the way to the future and ensure that no matter what variations happen, whatever happens to the code, whoever touches the code or provides improvements or additions or, or uses the code, 
It's always going to be there. It's always going to be available in the same sort of promise that I've made you before. It's always going to be free. So those are two different ways of looking at the three day basic uh, variant out there. Now certainly that is a very, very good simplification. I mean, I would not, you know, I'm sure if there are any lawyers in here, they would be cringing because that is very, very simplistic. Um, so, and when you think about it, you know, most open source licenses are small variations on these three basic types. But if you look at it that way, if you, if you kind of like base your, um, your selection of a license on these topics, on these sort of mentalities, then you'll have a much better feel for which license would most probably be a, a much better license for your, your project inside. Now, of course, within the ASF, we always use the permissive license, the Apache uh, V2 license, because that's just, you know, it, it, for the way the foundation is, that's how we want to ensure that the, that the project and the software is used. Another very, very confusing, or can be confusing, or complex topic is the whole idea about uh, governance and community. There are a whole bunch of different governance and community models for open source projects. Um, and, and we'll actually look at three of them right now, and we'll see how, what those variations are inside of there. First of all, there's sort of like the, the walled garden kind of model out there, which basically says, yeah, it's open source, it's under open source license, uh, and you can use it, and you can read it, and you can even, you know, do whatever you want to, want to do with it, but um, you can't have any influence or control over it. You can look at it, but you really can't have any sort of direction on where the software goes. Okay, we will pick and choose, we being an elect group of people that, you know, are, are far, far away, you know, and you have no control over them, we will select and choose which patches go in and which patches go out. So even though you're able to participate, it's up to a very, very short point, and there's a wall there, and you can't go any further, okay? It's a very, very controlled environment. And in general, what you'll see is that most of the, the open source projects which are in this walled guard kind of mentality are open source in, at least in my opinion, name only, in such that they're only open source because they're under an open source license and that's it. They're not really a community, they're basically leveraging crowdsourcing of, 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 of patches in, in, out there. You also see in a lot of cases that most walled garden type of communities are under a very, very strong copy left. Uh, you know, most of the, they're also very, very um, uh, common in, uh, uh, quote, commercial open source offerings. You know, companies which have a very, very, you know, uh, an open source project controlled by a single company uh, in general, like, you know, very, very strong copy left um, licenses. And, you know, to be a committer or a contributor, you would need to be, a, a, you know, hired by the company or something like that. So, again, that is a very common model. But for me, that only touches the aspect of what open source is about. It really it doesn't, uh, you know, really isn't what open source should be about but it is considered open source because it is an open source license. Now the second popular type is what's called a benevolent dictator for life. Uh, and the reason behind this is that, yeah, there is a, a controlling person who has ultimate authority on, on what the decisions are. They have the ultimate control on the direction and stuff like that. But as com what's different between that and the walled garden is that whereas the walled garden controlling entity assumes that power themselves, the benevolent dictator is actually given that power by the community. The community says, we trust you enough, you have proven yourself enough, that we will empower you to make these final decisions for us. Okay, what's important in that definition is not the dictator part, but the benevolent part. Okay, this is someone who loves the community and is trusted by the community enough that they are empowered to make these very, very, when you think about it, frightening decisions. The amount of power, for example, that Linus has is, is, is awesome. The reason why it works is because he is benevolent. He's got that outlook on what's good for the entire ecosystem and not just focused on very, very siloed approach on, on things like that. So that's very, very important. You also see um, these type of models in languages as well. You know, uh, um, even though PHP does not have that, uh, you know, Python, Ruby, it all, it's, it's nice for a language because it provides a singular vision for what that language looks like. Uh, by looking at, uh, for example, compare it with PHP. 
PHP is not a benevolent dictator for life. You know, uh, Rasmus created it, but you know, he, he you know, he doesn't provide that kind of power. And when if you look at the syntax of PHP, it's very, very haphazard. You know, sometimes it, you know, the 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 verbing is very, very strange. There's no consistency as far as parameters and stuff like that, um, because it's a universal vision, not a singular vision. You look at other languages like Python and Ruby, which is much more a, of a benevolent dictator sort of model, and its language is very construct, very concise, very focused. It almost looks as if it was written by one person, even though it was written by an entire community. This can work very, very well, and in fact, what you can see is that it doesn't necessarily need to be one singular individual. It can be a small group of people or some sort of hierarchy, but it does imply some sort of hierarchical um, you know, uh, structure to the way the community is developed and the way the community is run. The main takeaway from this is that there is someone in here who has the ultimate authority and responsibility to resolve conflicts. You know, to, you know. The third way, and this is what the Apache Software Foundation uses, is what's called meritocracy. And in this way right here, everyone is equal. Everyone is the boss. There's no person whose vote is much is is, is uh, more important than anybody else's. It's an extremely flat structure, an extremely flat hierarchy. And what's what's crucial about this is, whereas the benevolent dictator for life methodology had that safety valve, that knowing that if the community can't come up and resolve a problem, we know that somebody else will. The meritocracy doesn't have that freedom, doesn't have that flexibility, doesn't have that safety valve they're forced in a lot of ways to achieve consensus because they're the only people who can. And this really empowers the community much more because they take much of a, more of a personal investment into it. I'm not saying that you know, the other types are wrong, but for um, you know, communities and projects which are designed to create long-term sustainable projects that will survive the ebb and flow of volunteer energy, that will survive the um, uh, you know, key people with the organization leaving, meritocracy is a great way of doing it. And meritocracy basically is the idea that you achieve merit. If you start providing patches or writing documentation, you earn merit. And you go up in the ranks of what your responsibilities are and your freedoms are by depending on, on meritocracy. However, in most cases, again, the, the structure of meritocracy is very, very flat. There is a lot of variations or hierarchies inside there. Inside the ASF, the only real levels are, for example, a, a committer, someone who actually has the ability to, to physically uh, touch the, uh, the canonical code on the, on the repo, uh, and, and a uh, contributor or a PMC member. And those are the people who have the ultimate say on the direction and flow of that. That's it. There's those two levels that are in there as far as the code is concerned. And so someone who's a PMC member, once they've achieved that certain level of merit, they're there. Okay, so if you're there for six months or have been there for 12 years, it's not like the person with 12 years has gained more merit. There's the level of merit and that's how much they take. So their votes are the exact same and it really provides the opportunity to have new blood come in. If it was always an increasing level of merit, somebody who would be interested in joining the project would say, there's no way on God's green earth that I would be able to produce enough or do enough to reach up that, 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 uh, that high up, okay? By making those levels low and very, very flat, it means that people say, oh, well, it won't take me that long to achieve that kind of merit and be up there with somebody who's been there for, for you know, 10, 12 years or whatever. So it ensures a really long-term, sustainable, uh, healthy community out there. Another variation within the, uh, the open source world are the concepts of foundations, you know, and we, we know of a, a couple, of, at least, you know, today, there's the Linux Foundation and the Apache and stuff like that. Well, there are really three basic types of foundations that you see out there in the, in, in the world today uh, as used by the, uh, the, the open source community. First of all is, is what's called a public charity. There's a specific IRS classification called a 501c3. And it really is designed for, uh, an, an entity that wants to create software or code for the public good, okay? Everything the ASF does is for the public in general, not to benefit a single vendor, not to benefit a single uh, you know, person or member within the ASF, it's for everyone. It's a very, very flat, neutral place, and it's a really safe place for, 
for companies and organizations to know that no one will be treated special. There's no way that the ASF, for example, could treat one of our sponsors any more special than anybody else because that's not keeping everything flat and level. So the 501c3 um, is, uh, is a pretty popular uh, um, uh, foundation out there. The Free Software Foundation is also another one of those. What we're really seeing lately has been uh, a real increase in what's called the, the 501c6s, which are uh, trade groups. Um, in fact, most of the new foundations being created now in the open source movement are of this type. And it's, and it's called a, a trade group because it provides the ability for companies and, and, and commercial organizations to have much more of a direct impact and influence on the direction of an open source project out there. So for example, the, the Clips Foundation, um, you know, they have the idea of a corporate member. And a corporate member, if you pay enough, you get a board seat. And though you're, so you're able to actually provide a little bit more influence and direction um, inside there. The Linux Foundation is a 501c6. Um, and I think, not to take anything away from Eclipse, but the reason why I like the Linux Foundation model is that because it has Linus as sort of like a leveling influence. So even though there are a bunch of trade organizations inside of the Linux Foundation who obviously are wanting to pay for the direction of, of, of Linux, Linus is there to prevent that from happening. So in my, in my opinion, if you do have an open source uh, foundation, which is sort of like this type, it works better if, um, if the power still resides in the open source community itself. If the open source community is driven by a, a meritocracy, a very strong meritocracy, um, or if there is a benevolent dictator, then these can work very, very well. Otherwise, you, get, you could theoretically get you know, conflicts between the, the ebb and flow of, of commercial interests, which, which isn't a bad thing, but you know, sometimes it can you know, hurt the, uh, the, the growth of the, uh, the open source organization. And finally, there are those foundations in which they aren't foundations. They're basically just uh, you know, uh, a loose collaboration of people who are trying to do things. I mean, most of the open source projects on, on GitHub, for example, uh, are not under any kind of foundational rule at all. Um, they're just you know, people sharing code and things like that. Um, one of the nice things about, one of the many nice things about foundations is that they have a structure inside there to ensure that there is IP tracking. For example, you're, you know, you're assured that there's IP clearance on all the commode commits coming in. There's a known quantity as far as uh, you know, where the, um, the code is coming from, uh, how can I join, how can I help, and things like that. What license is this under? I mean, those are all part and parcel of being under a foundation. This is much more structured. Whereas when you go and just download something off of uh, SourceForge or um, you know, GitHub or something like that, you know, in fact, most of the, the, the projects on GitHub don't even have an associated license with them. So legally, because there is no license associated with them, they are copyrighted code. And you're not really, you know, it's not really yours to take unless there's a specific license out there. Um, copyright is assumed unless you specifically say, say nothing about it. Um, and so the, the growth of these non-foundation foundations, which are basically just independent open source projects, I think would benefit by at least having some of the structure of more normal and, uh, and viable open source projects out there. Now, community building is also another complex topic, and there's a lot of different ways of looking at it. I mean, I, I know uh, John O'Bacon does the, uh, the, the leadership summit and things like that and goes to a lot of detail on how to build community, and it is very, very difficult to do. And so trying to distill it down into three basic types is really doing it the service. But I, I think there are um, three cores that we use within the ASF, which I think has been a, a large part, and, uh, part uh, of our success. Now, one is the idea of using email lists. Now, it doesn't have to be email, but let me tell you why we, we do use email. Okay? And part of the reason why is because you need to look back and figure out what was the origin of the Apache Group and the Apache Software Foundation. Why do we exist? And the reason why is because there were a number of us using the old NCSA web server. And Rob McCool was basically the only person developing that code. So when Netscape started, Rob left, you know, stopped developing that code. The NCSA web server went stagnant and there was nobody developing anything. So, so 
you had this great code base that a lot of people were using, but nobody was maintaining it. So we needed to make sure that we needed to ramp things up. We needed to create the web server project and a community around it so that no one else would ever be in the same situation that we were. We wanted to ensure that a, 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 a soft, a, a, an open source project could survive people leaving, companies not being interested any longer, large groups of developers, because they were volunteers, no longer having the free cycle. You know, somebody had a baby, I can't code for six months, I'm too busy, okay? We needed to ensure that, that projects were able to survive those kind of really, really semi-potentially destructive events. Email is nice because, first of all, it's archivable. So if you're away for six months, you can very, very easily go back, read through the archives, and find out exactly what's happened in the last six months. Okay? Any other method would be very, very difficult. If all your development was done on IRC and you're not logging it, and it would be impossible to be able to look back and, and figure out what was going on behind there. Another good thing about email lists is that it's, it's not a synchronous communication. Okay, if you're, again, if all your development is on IRC, for example, unless you happen to be in the same time zone, you're disenfranchising huge, huge numbers of population. How can you drive in people if, well, I'm busy between, you know, 9 to 5 Eastern time, and I'm, you know, in Australia, I would really love to join this project, but there's nothing, email lists provide that kind of, sort of like, you know, time insensitive, insens insensitivity to it. So the whole idea behind using email lists is to make it easy for people to lurk, to see what's going on inside the, uh, the, the project uh, without having to you know, um, you know, get too involved. It's easy to look through an email list and follow what's going on. As long as you're quiet, nobody knows you're there. It's a great way to get you know, an awareness of what's going on in the community. It's a great way of leaving and joining a community as your time comes and flows. It's a great way of uh, archiving what's going on in the background. The main idea behind it is you don't want to disenfranchise current and potential developers. And email lists uh, provide that sort of flexibility. Also, the nice thing about that is that it's all public. So any development that's being done on any Apache project has to be done on the public mailing list. If development had, was not done on the, uh, on the public mailing list, it simply didn't happen. Okay, if something was happening, you know, even here at, the, at ApacheCon when there's hackathons and things like that, anything you talk about here uh, regarding the, the direction of a, of a project you happen to be working on needs to be sent back to the public list so other people can, can be aware of it and comment on it and things like that. The other thing which is very, very important and again goes back to the concept of community is to drive consensus. Okay, the, the power of the vote inside of Apache is very, very important because it provides the ability for everyone to express an opinion. And we, want, and, and we strive to ensure that everyone has the ability to, to have a vote, to make a voice, but also that their vote and their voice is important. So before any major actions within um, any uh, Apache project, there's usually a vote called to gauge how the rest of the community feels about that. And even though, in general, most of these things, most of the votes from only the PMC members are considered binding, okay, you always get votes from everybody else. You always want to gauge not only what the PMC, the project management committee of the project is worried about, but you also want to see how the community itself feels. And something is very, very wrong, for example, if the PMC all votes plus one on something, and the community votes minus one or minus zero or something like that. That shows a real disjunct between there. So as much as possible, engage the community. Engage their conversation. Try to find out what the consensus is, and try to drive the consensus. Okay, try to do the sort of like uh, uh, give and take required to, to create a collaborative, acceptable solution for a problem that drives out there. Voting is the way that the ASF does, but there are a lot of different ways of, of doing that. And as I said before, this is really, really important in those type of um, models which are meritocratic, okay, because you need to ensure that everyone feels empowered to have that, uh, that vote inside there. Uh, and finally, one of the things to, to really avoid is the, is the concept of poisonous people, okay? Um, 
again, looking at it from the community standpoint, if you have a developer who is a coding maniac, and he or she is just pounding out code like crazy, okay, you might think, that's great, that's fantastic. The project is moving along so much. But if that person is so poisonous, so abrasive on the mailing list and, and things like that, that it actually drives people away, that people join the mailing list to see what's going on with this great project, um, and they have great ideas, but I can't stand this person. He's, he's always abrasive, he's, he, you know, it, they will move away. People will not join someplace that they don't feel welcome in. So as much as of a short-term gain it might be to say, yeah, we'll just put up with uh, him or her because he's, they're really cranking out code, it really is long-term damaging to the health and viability of an open source project. So as much as possible, avoid, well, always avoid poisonous people. Now there are, of course, you know, ways of, of asking people to tone down and stuff like that, but the real reason is that, again, you've got to ensure that your, your uh, community feels engaged, feels empowered, and it's a welcoming place for people to, um, uh, to join. So in summary, basically, everything about an open source project is stuff that you learned in kindergarten. There are three main rules to take away. First of all, play nice with everybody. Okay, we're all in the sandbox together, okay? Have fun, enjoy yourself. Secondly, share, okay? If, if your neighbor wants half a cookie, give them a half a cookie, okay? Share the code, share the trouble, share the conversation, share the problem, okay? Work together on, on a solution. You know, don't try to, you know, set, set yourself away, okay? Um, you know, if you're one of those kind of developers who just, you know, pounds out code and then commits it, Okay, you're not sharing, you know, you're basically just working along and just dumping it around. Work with other people, you know, it, it, engage other people to improve yourself. And the main thing is, is, like I said before, to have fun in open source project, okay? Even though a number of people within the ASF uh, are paid by their day jobs to work on the ASF, they are really here because they love the project, okay? It's a fun place because it's not work. Even if it is work for them, it's not work. So make sure that you're having fun in any kind of open source project. The power of open source uh, is scratching your own itch, is the, and the ability to do so, and the ability to do, do so in a project which is important enough that it has world-changing consequences. So as long as you follow those rules, you'll be able to really engage the community, you'll be able to really enjoy the kind of open source project that you're involved in, and it'll be a place to have fun. So. That is end of, end of my uh, prepared slides. I do, do want to leave time for some Q&A at the end. Uh, that's my Twitter feed, and those are all my emails and stuff like that. Uh, the slides are available on SlideShare as well as the, um, the actual uh, ApacheCon site. So does anyone have any questions? We do have some time. Yes? The question was, is there any advice on what to do with poisonous people? Um, I, I, um, we're a community, you know, um, in fact, there are some people who even go so far as saying we're a family, okay? Everybody has inside their family people who are really, really nasty, that you're not even looking forward to Thanksgiving because you got to put up with Uncle Jeff, right? Well, there's somebody most probably in the family who knows Uncle Jeff well enough that says, Jeff, you're being a prick, come on, you know, you know, tone down. Okay, if there's someone in that community if there's someone in the open source project who knows that person well enough, have them, you know, give them a sit down. Let them, you know, try to explain why they're, uh, they're you know, they're being that way. Um, another thing which is, um, which is quite possible is that, and you see it all the time, is that there are people who on email are very, very different than what, how they are in real life. They don't realize that how they're communicating by email is abrasive. And so again, there are ways that you can go in and, and help them, you know, maybe they don't realize, you know, how, how badly they're being. But there are people who are just jerks. There are just people who are poisonous people and cannot be changed. And for the health of the community, for the health of the project, you have to let them go. You have to say, you know, this, you know, we have, you, 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 you know, we're removing your commit privileges, you're no longer part of the PMC, uh, whatever that is. If you can't change that person, you've got to, you know, sort of like cut off the arm to save the body, okay? Uh, there is a fantastic, and I wish I had the URL for it, but um, um, uh, 
Uh, ben and Fitz did a great thing about uh, how to cope with poisonous people. Uh, if you just uh, you know, go on YouTube and, and Google that, they do a, um, a series of, of talks on how to deal with poisonous people in Open Source Projects. And they also have some guidelines as well. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the question was, is that, is that uh, everything that Apache does within reasons, within bounds, or, uh, is public. Now, certainly, um, um, you want to avoid anything that would be done publicly which would really harm that individual. Okay, uh, if you can do it, you know, if you can encourage them to leave or something like that, that's, that, that's fine. But um, bringing someone within the PMC is a, is a public decision. Okay, because the PMC is a, is a legal construct within the, the, the ASF. Uh, the board, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a uh, vote that's done by the PMC. The board needs to act that, or used to need to act that. But it's a public event. Um, by someone leaving, that also has to be a, a public event as well. Now, you can avoid that, doing that, but you should really you know, make sure there is consensus within the PMC that, that needs to be done. The question was, can anyone vote, uh, uh, or, you know, or is it just the PMC? Um, in general, the, it, most PMCs have two, well, three mailing lists. You know, there is the user mailing list, there's the dev mailing list, and the private mailing list. And the private mailing list is private to just the PMC members themselves. Hardly every, anything is ever done on the private uh, list, except for um, like voting in people. Because obviously you can't do those kind of votes on the development list because just say I want to vote Phil into something and I, you know, and people say, oh, no, Phil's not ready. Phil, you know, they, they, well, that would be disheartening, you know, to Phil. Um, but everything else needs to be done out in the open. So if there is a code patch, you know, or it's just saying, you know, there's a backport request to take something from trunk to a releasable, uh, you know, branch, um, that's done on the development list. And any, anybody can vote, okay, as I said before, only the people who are PMC members, their votes are binding, but, you know, most PMCs encourage other people to vote as well, because that feedback is very important, because the PMC really is the steward of the project for that community. So gauging the community uh, is, is very, very important in those cases. Right. Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely agree. Uh, Lewis's point was that uh, basically, um, uh, poisonous is, is is there are a lot of ways to be a poisonous person. You know, I, I specifically said you know abrasive. You know, but there are a lot of other different ways. For example, um, if the way you interact makes it, you know, uh, either by um, you know the the way you're posting on the email or why way you're doing uh, um, commits or or things like that make it difficult for people who are coming in from the outside to get engaged. Then that can also be perceived as poisonous. Poisonous is anything that would prevent um, you know people coming in off the street from feeling welcomed into uh, you know providing sort of you know welcoming you to uh, be a committer or developer on that project. And there are a lot of different ways you know, for that, uh, that poison to happen. So um, it's important to be sensitive that, yeah, the traditional way of thinking about poisonous people are people who are just really, really abrasive and jerks and all that kind of stuff. But there are other things that could also make it difficult for people to engage with the community that may not be pur purposefully, um, you know, just, you know, normal behaviorally, you know, agnostic, ag agnostic. Anything else? Any other questions? No? Well, thank you very much.